Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing this afternoon at two o'clock? Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing this afternoon? At We're getting feedback, John, so we have to start afternoon, over again. Evening, it's coming through a thing. Give me another cue there to start. Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever time you're tuning in the program called What's Going On. And we have changed our name here at what was once FlintTalkRadio.com. And I came to the studio to find out that today our name has been changed to All Points TV. So there's always something going on new here at the studio. And I don't know what to expect next week. We've been changing it uh, on a weekly basis. And we're just beginning to grow by leaps and bounds. And every year, every week I come in and I find what the latest news is. And the news today is that our name has been changed to protect the guilty or the innocent, as the case may be. We're now All Points TV, but you can find us in the same place on Ustream, and also I'll be posting on my own Facebook wall once this program is up and running, and we will uh, have it posted on Facebook. And I'm going to um, have our program today kind of play off of what I posted on Facebook before coming to the studio this afternoon. I'm doing I'm doing a uh, three-part series right now, uh, really, on... Uh, the uh, Middle East, and I think I just posted, I think there was about three pages I just posted on Facebook. <clears throat> Some people have told me that my post on, on the uh, network, uh, Facebook network, is the longest, uh, of the longest posts that are placed on that site, and I wouldn't doubt that. And there are some that are asking me, what do you find the time to do that? Because I post on a daily basis. And I tell them what I told what I told persons that asked me when I was uh, teaching in public school, they asked me, when, when do you find, what do you find time to read? And my answer is, I don't find time to read and I don't find time to post on Facebook. I find time to go to the store or I find time to be with my friends at some local coffee shop and we sit around and we talk about some of the issues that are pressing <clears throat> during the uh, day, um, uh, maybe in the last week or so. Uh, I, don't find, I don't find time to uh, write my articles on Facebook, and I didn't find time when I was teaching in public school to read. <clears throat> I find time for the other things, and those things that are primary and important to me, I don't find time for those things. I make time out of the time that I save elsewhere. <clears throat> and so I don't uh, find time to, to post on Facebook. What I, what I have done is I've cut off and cut out of my schedule television watching which I was uh, doing that in piecemeal anyway. I was uh, cutting out the commercials by taping the programs first that I want to see, and then I cut the commercials out and just watched the, what well, basically were the news programs or the commentary programs on the uh, cable networks that discuss the news items for that day. But I've even cut that out now, and I get most of my news, really all of my news, from the Internet. And then when persons are posting on the uh, Facebook site, they uh, many, many of them... My, my seems like my readers, or those that I'm that that are, that I friended and have asked me for friendship on Facebook, seems seems like most of those persons are people that are very studious. So that if I go on the site where all of their listings are, I can read in two or three minutes <clears throat> um, a lot of the news rather than waiting around for how the networks do it. They may have one key story and it's built around a whole lot of um, meandering. Um, um, insignificant kinds of information, I can get that information in two to three minutes by just simply going to Facebook, going on the general site where everybody's postings are, and just reading what they have found uh, in their discovery of what was in, in the news that day, and read what they read the sites they posted and their comments, and I'm pretty much informed about what happened during the day by just reading Facebook. And I've saved, I'm, I don't know how many hours I've saved by doing that. I, I had saved about three hours uh, when I was um, uh, cutting out the commercials. But now that I'm cutting out the programs, the commercials brought to the airwaves, I've cut out even the additional time and just simply letting the uh, people on Facebook who are free thinkers post what they found of some importance during the course of the uh, day. And I just read that and I'm pretty much informed about uh, what happened during the uh, time that um, I left the Facebook network the day before, and I'm able to catch up on the reading just by reading the comments that they post. 
So uh, this, I'm in the best of both worlds right now, able to post my own articles in a timely manner and then become informed about what's going on out there by look, looking at and reading the posts of other people. And really, Facebook is doing it for me. And also the uh, Internet, I do watch the Drudge Report, and I um, go through the articles that they list. I list all the articles. I go to some of my favorite uh, writers at the bottom of the Drudge Report's uh, listing. So I suggest some of you that have not done that yet will tune to that particular post. I also read Media Research Center, and um, and it's really amazing how much time, how much time, <laughs> just with those things, I have so much time on my hands. So people think I spend a lot of time on uh, the um, uh, on the you know on the um, the circuit because uh, I write these long articles. They think I spend a lot of time on the circuit uh, because. My articles are kind of long, and I have to do the research to put put them up there. And they think I'm spending all this time just sitting at my typewriter, uh, in my word processor all day, typing these articles. And really, it doesn't take that much time. I think I probably spent about maybe two hours now, where I was spending three and four hours just watching the alphabet soup try to stay up on what they're doing on uh, basically Fox. I have to be honest and just tell you, mostly it was uh, Fox, and I had kind of tuned out uh, the CNN, uh, I, I, I just have a hard, I had a hard time listening uh, to CNN. I always had a, a problem listening to MSNBC. Uh, I, was, I would uh, go from one absurdity to another, but MSNBC, N, MSNBC or MSLSD, which is what some call it, uh, <laughs> or let's see, what's the other one? MSDNC. Um, <laughs> Because it's really, it's really like you know tuning in a channel of um, of the Obama administration's uh, news. After I get through listening to our uh, Ernest, who, who replaced uh, Jay Carney as the uh, mouthpiece of the Obama administration, now you can tune into uh, you can tune into to MSNBC and to some extent CNN, and you got just an extension of the Obama administration news. So. But anyway, I've cut it out, and and cutting out that source, and uh, just looking at it sparingly. Sometimes somebody will post them on Facebook, and I will uh, be interested in it. I'll go and and, and um, if they've not posted it, I'll go and draw it up and look at it from the uh, YouTube, and I can do it in five minutes. Uh, you know, those 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 um, segments only last about about no longer than eight minutes because they had to cut away to commercial to pay for it. And I can just go right to the, to the uh, after being informed of what was uh, placed on the network, I can go right to it on YouTube later on and read it or watch it, really watch it on YouTube. And I have the uh, whole segment, and I don't have to stay there for an hour and watch it. So all the time that I was spending in the, um, in the, in the uh, media, I'm saving that time now and just simply writing my articles with the time that I'm saving and so people should not think that I'm spending a whole lot of time just sitting at the word, word processor and typing out the articles for the day. It doesn't take that much time, uh, maybe about an hour, and then I spend another five or ten minutes, you know, going back over it and breaking the paragraphs up because it looks differently when you're on the word processor and when you're on, on the Facebook. The paragraphs look longer on Facebook because it's not like the whole page. So I have to go back and break the paragraphs up, and that takes about maybe between five and ten minutes but an hour to, to, to type the articles out. And I try to make sure that I'm respecting the readers because I do have some readers in my posts and I try to respect the readers and save them some time but not having to go through it and look at all the errors and misspell words, try to get all that corrected. So when they go into the site, they can just write through the narrative and not be sidetracked by having to figure out what is he trying to say there, what's that word? And I, I kind of iron those kinks out hopefully for the, for the readers. But uh, I'm doing that series, uh, I, this is the second segment today, and I'm doing a series on the foreign policy that we have in the Middle East, and I'll be doing the third segment tomorrow, third we, and last segment tomorrow. We have a foreign policy? <laughs> yeah, and, I, and that's the other part of it. Uh, the, the absence of a foreign policy, I'm, I'm talking about how the foreign policy has been one that has been uh, g directed to fail. The, fa the failures are some some of the failures are intended and I'm, and I'm, I've been going back and I'll share that with you later on 
as we get into the last segment of the program, and I'll go back and, and talk about, I'll go back to, um, let's see, how far am I going back? I'm going back to 1979 when the annual total community came into power in Iran, and I'll try to tie that into our conversation today. But uh, anyway, it's three parts, and I, I'm very glad to be able to report also uh, that next week I'll be doing at least one segment. I'm not sure how many segments it's going to take, um, but I will do at least one segment on what I'm putting together in a five-part series on Facebook next week, starting uh, Monday. Uh, if I'll be ready to go forward with a segment I'm doing, the five-part series I'm doing uh, on the monetary system in the United States. And I'm ready to do that part now because I'm finishing up the last book I had put on my reading list to do that, and that was a book by Griffin called The uh, Creature from Jekyll Island. And uh, I, I, th I have to give uh, Griffin a lot of credit for the research that he did. I do uh, uh, have some uh, objections to uh, him going beyond his evidence sometimes and make some claims that uh, he, he offers some evidence for it, and I'll be pointing some of those things out. But I do have to give him a lot of credit because the book he wrote is immaculately, you know, um, researched, if I can use the word immaculately research. Uh, he does, he, he's done his homework, and I, I will uh, use him as like uh, maybe the third source because I think that the main source that I have to use based upon his research, much smaller book, by the way, is the one written by Murray Rothbard, and because Rothbard was considered to be the most the most informed person out there on the uh, Federal Reserve System and the central banking of of the uh, United States, I have to use him as a foundational uh, writer. But Griffin is a very close second in terms of what Griffin does. I disagree with some of his conclusion. I'll be pointing it out starting uh, next week. Hopefully, we can do that in one segment. But if not, we'll take as many segments as we need to uh, complete it. Because I'm doing five segments on Facebook Monday through Friday of next week, and I'm ready to go forward with that now, having uh, finished uh, Griffin's uh, book. And I've read The House of Morgan by Ron Chernoff. And some of you out there that have read that, like uh, I won't call his name on the air, I have, don't have his permission to use his name. But I, I did notice, and one of my uh, one of the persons that posted on my wall on, on another um, uh, post that I did in May, I went back and, and read some of the comments that one of the posts that I did on some aspect of the monetary system. And I saw a, a person on there that I, after having read Ron Chernoff's book, I went back to read the comment, and I noticed that this person seemed to have been quoting something from Chernoff's book, which at the time when I posted it in May, I hadn't read Chernoff's book, so I wasn't aware where it came from, but I knew the person was informed. And then when I read Chernoff, I saw, well, that comment seems to be what Chernoff was talking about. And I asked him, did you read um, Chernoff's book? And sure enough, he had read it and um, made some very incisive comments, which I'll be incorporating those uh, ideas into my, my post also. But anyway, next week I'm, I'm going to start with, a on Monday, a five-part series on uh, the monetary system. And I'll tell you something. I went around a lot of crevices and curves. Uh, it's just so many different little angles you have to watch out for. A lot of curves in trying to understand the monetary system because it is... I think, and this is my own opinion here, I, I think it's uh, deliberately uh, to make complex. And so you have to, <laughs> there's a lot of little curves you have to go around to find out, okay, what is the information here? And I, I have to, I had to go through a lot of minefields to arrive at some of the conclusions I've drawn. But I think that when I make the presentation, I think it will be shown that I didn't just jump out here without having done some of the homework that I wasn't prepared to get out there with until I read these uh, may, may basically four books, but some other books on the side that I kind of cursed and ran through. But there are some books that, I, that I'm using foundationally. I had to read over and over again. I had to read um, uh, this 750-page book by Chernoff twice because, uh, you know, you go back over these books and you have missed some things, and now you read this book and you have to go back and kind of go back over what he said and tie that in. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, homework you do before you come out there in public so as to be able to dot all your I's and cross all your T's because you try to quiet your critics, uh, some of whom text me, uh, not all of them are being <laughs> not all of them are being civil, by the way, 
And some of them using these expedited deleted on my posts, trying to discourage me from getting out there and saying anything in addition to what I said. And what it does is that it just encourages me to get back out there with even more. <laughs> I did a post. I did a post last week, and I I made the comment. I, I, it was a post I did on uh, Raven Simone's uh, comments, and all of you are aware that she did an interview with Oprah Winfrey, who sat there squirming in her seat. She couldn't believe the woman that uh, the grown up. Cosby actress was saying that she was um, an American but was not an African American and of course Oprah couldn't take that. Not when everybody's out here calling themselves African American although none of them have been over to Africa. And, I, and Oprah's only been to uh, South Africa. I doubt if she'd been to the places, I know she hasn't been to the countries I've been in, in Africa. She's over there supporting a school over in uh, South Africa so she's been there. I don't think she's been in other parts of Africa. You've been to how many, how many uh, countries in Africa? Uh, there are 55 countries in Africa. 55? 55. 55, because uh, Sudan just split from, used to be one country, Sudan, where they've now got northern Sudan, which is uh, Muslim, and they got southern Sudan, uh, which split away from it just a, a couple of uh, years ago. I don't even think it's been two years. But recently there was a split between, the friction was such that they, uh, uh, the northern Sudan and the southern part of Sudan were having so, so much problems with each other that that split occurred. So the 54 nations that were there, 47 of which were below the Sahara Desert, they now have 48 countries below the Sahara Desert right now with the six nations. And I'll name them for you because I don't want you to think we're up here just spreading hot air. The six nations above the Sahara, which were uh, starting on the eastern part, north and eastern part of uh, Africa, which would be Egypt, then next door to Egypt is Libya, then Tunisia to the north, uh, Algeria, um, 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 then you have, I said, I said Algeria, then you have Morocco, and then below that over to the um, west and to the south somewhere is Mauritania. So those six nations, all of which are uh, Islamic uh, nations, uh, would have been those nations above the Sahara, but the Africans in, um, on the continent of Africa have been, as, as Franz Fanon says in a book called uh, Black Skin, White Mask, says that the the native, the indigenous population, which has been pushed further to the south, so that you begin to see then the Africa, the African expression of the African continent really is uh, below the Sahara with the Muslim expression in the, on the continent of Africa too much to the north. And of course the, the movement further south uh, also going on right now as Islam is spreading its wings in Africa as it's doing in other parts of the world as well. <clears throat> and if you read some of the writers about that, you'll see that they're saying that the reason why Islam did not take over the whole continent at that time, and this is very interesting to me to, to have read this. Uh, I read this in George Yitte's book. Uh, this is called um, Africa Unchained. And George Yitte, who is a Ghanaian uh, historian who's over here teaching at one of the universities over here, in the United States said that the Muslim incursion, which would have started in the seventh century of the Common Era, you call it the seventh century AD or the 600 year period AD, <clears throat> that they stopped their um, colonization of Africa because they wanted to have some population that was not Muslim so that they could in fact enslave that part of the population. But then he says in the book there that when, the, when Europe came in later on, and Europe's um, co colonization period doesn't really start until the 19th century, although some think it would have started uh, during the time of the slave trade, which is not true because the slave trade would have started in the 15th century. If you want to start it at 1441, there'd be one date you could have because that's when the Portuguese would have carried some of the blacks to Western Europe, very shrink, a small segment, 200 persons altogether. In 1444, well, it was 10 in 1441 and in 200 in 1444. So it was a small trickling of the slave trade at that point. But the actual colonization of, of Africa by Europe does not take place until uh, the 18, the latter part of the 1800s, the 19th century, starting around 1884 with the Berlin Conference, uh, which would have been uh, held to carve up Africa. And if you look at Africa, you'll see the map uh, as an indication of that, where they have it, uh, you can see the lines like in Libya, straight, it's like straight lines, you know, at a, at a 90 degree angle, because it's like this and cut that way. And you can tell somebody went to a map and just carved it up because they now have to go to, to 
how they're going to carve the territory up so as to, to avoid having to go to war over everybody vying for territory. Now, that, what I understand, too, though, Ethiopia today is in a different place, basically, than it had been before. Yes. Ethiopia was actually further to the east at one time, wasn't it? Well, it's to the east right now, where it was in, in the ancient times. And the Bible talks about Ethiopia It is above, when I say above, it means south, because we're talking about the direction of the Nile River. So that Egypt... So that Ethiopia was above, or to say south of Egypt. So if you go down, if you go up the Nile, since the Nile flows to the north, so going up the Nile is to go south then, and we have to change our orientation toward up and down because rivers uh, run downhill. Uh, that's, that's one reason I, I always say, that's one reason I know that Jack and Jill couldn't have gone up the hill to get in the water. <laughs> Where were their parents? <laughs> but uh, that's another story, right? But... The Nile River flows is one of the two rivers that flow uh, uh, south. Of course, the Amazon River flows in a number of directions, but it eventually does, um, uh, it, it flows uh, north too. So most rivers, though, flow south. The only two rivers that flow north um, would be the Amazon River in South America and the Nile River in, in Africa. All the other rivers in the world Look at the Mississippi River as an example of that. Missouri River, another example. Ohio River, another example. And you see the rivers going to the south. And of course, you know rivers are on the land as a way of draining the water off the land. And that's what rivers are designed to do. Of course, you can put a boat on there and go out there and go fishing. <laughs> that's what you had it to it. What nature had, the intent of nature was something different, right? And that's to take the water off the land and then pour it into the sea so that you can drain. It's a drainage uh, system that's built um, uh, on the land. But if you go into Egypt, and you go into North East Africa, or go into a Nile Valley, you find that the, um, that the uh, Nile uh, River, which is 4,100 um, uh, miles in, in length, if you started at the, uh, what is called the Lake in Wanzi and Yanza, which, the, uh, which you call it Lake Victoria right now, because you named it after, this, uh, uh, after the uh, daughter of uh, Edward VI, who was the uh, uh, who was the son, one of the sons, one of the uh, one of the nine sons of uh, Queen Victoria. You know she had she had. Um, I'm sorry. That yeah, it, yeah, you, that's right. Maybe he would be the son of Queen Victoria, but he, the but the but the grandson of. Um, the great grandson of uh, Sophia and George III. I want to make sure I get that right because you have to trace the pedigree back to the king that we were fighting over there in, in, in England. A German family, by the way. A German family, from the Hanover family uh, from, from Germany. And that's the uh, line. You know, King George III, by the way, was the first of the King Georges that could speak English. The, the first two Georges were German that could speak English. <laughs> so they had, they had England they couldn't even speak the language. Uh, but the point I'm making here is, uh, is, is another point, and I'm making the point that, um, that the, the above Egypt, above, above being, 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 you're going up the Nile, so you're going south, uh, lower Egypt would be to the north because you're looking at up and down by the direction of the river because rivers do flow downhill. And so downhill in the Nile Valley would be going in the northern direction. So we have to change our orientation toward up and down. I mean, I mean, for example, you say that you're going uh, down south. You know, it's not any more hilly going in that direction. It would be going another direction. And so when you say you're going down south, that's just a matter of how you look at the idea of up and down. The orientation is different here than it is in Egypt. Going up and down would be just the opposite. So going above, uh, going up, into Africa. So that's another thing. You're going up when you're going into Africa, but if you don't have the power to define up and down, then you're going up into Europe. You see, you have another orientation there. You're going up into Europe, down into Africa. But, but who's doing the defining here? Well, the persons that have the uh, the last, the latest, the most mechanized instruments of warfare define the uh, reality. And you know what? Now that I'm I'm on that point. I like to make these side points. You know, when I'm in class, I try to, uh, and, and I'm not sure exactly where my students are in terms of their interests, so I try to go away from the lesson around and then bring them back to the lesson. 
as a way of capturing the interest from a different place than maybe where most of them would be, which most of them would be centered in the lesson. But just go out there and capture them and bring them to the lesson by maybe going to some area that they're interested in. And uh, the point about about up and down could be related to them. They're from the, the mamas of the moms are from the south, and so uh, when they get ready to travel and go back to their roots in the south, where y'all were mad at uh, at uh, Raven Simone saying she's from uh, Louisiana and that's her roots, and y'all got mad at her because you thought she should have claimed that she could go across the water and find her roots over there, where Alice Taylor claimed he found his roots over there in Gammy at the Jufferu at the Jufferay group, which is um, uh, nonsense, and, you know. <laughs> and Gates, when you went over there, uh, this is for you, Professor Gates, <laughs> at Harvard University, you know, hey, look, I, I'm i not intimidated. I've, I've talked to Gates. And I'll tell you something. I, I felt like telling Gates, and I, and I felt like telling Manny Marable, get a pencil and write this down. Uh, I've been meeting with these people at these large universities. Uh, Manny Marable deceased right now, but I'm going to talk about him uh, uh, in his deceased state. Uh, he can't hit me in the eye. Uh, <laughs> he said, you shouldn't, hit a, you shouldn't talk about a person when they deceased. Well, no person has ever come back from the dead and, 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 and smacked me one. So I'm going to talk, talk about him now. Um, I, I would say with Manny Marable. Manny Marable was, was a professor at Columbia University. And a very smart man. But I would say with him for lunch, and I'm sitting here listening to this man tell me that there's a such thing. I, I, I told him that um, Bell Hooks in a book called Killing Rage had said in the first part of a book, there's no such thing as black orthodoxy, which is what they're really angry with Raven Simone about because Raven Simone was saying that her point of view is different from that of Oprah Winfrey. And therefore, here's her point of view. But that's not to be allowed because you got to be in lockstep and here's black orthodoxy and you're not walking down this road. So what's your problem? Well... I'm sitting at the table with a man who thought I had a problem when I told him that what Bell Hook said. <clears throat> and he said to me, he said, um, uh, there is a, a black orthodoxy. You know what I told him? I'm sitting there listening to this man, I mouth that nonsense. I lean into him. You know, I'm trying to make a point that I want to be sure you make sure you hear it because I don't like to whisper a lot. <laughs> I lean into him and said, give me an example. And he hadn't thought about that because they think that if they're working at Columbia University and Harvard University and they tell you something, you're just supposed to write it down. You're not supposed to ask any question. They have the, they have the gospel from the mountaintops. So I asked him to give me an example. i tell you what. When he gave me his, that noise, he was getting up to speak at the place where we were. He's, he's the, the keynote speaker. He got up to speak. And he said, uh, we got some people over here at this table that... <laughs> raised some questions that I hadn't thought of. I, I know, because you think that because you had read a few books, nobody else read any books. And so you've been running that noise by uh, your students, and they hadn't read anything except what you told them to read for the test. And any question they raised, they raised their hand and asked, is that going to be on the test? So I was asking that, that question, because you weren't ready. You, you, you're not able to test me. You may think that you are. That's all of y'all out there. You may, <laughs> hey. So anyway, he said, we got some people over here at this table. And so that was the Kool-Aid he was drinking. And, and Manny Marable, by the way, by his last book was a book on the reinvention of Malcolm X. I have to tell you something. It's a little secret. Manny Marable, last book that he wrote is a travesty in, in writing. He didn't know what he was talking about in that book. And I and I find it and I find what he wrote in that book to be unforgivable, particularly when he wrote the introduction to the book written by John Carew, uh, who wrote a book called The Ghost of Malcolm X. This guy from uh, Trinidad wrote the book. And I find with Manning Marable, after having wrote, written that introduction to that book, which was written in the nineties, I find Manning Marable's writing of the book right before he, he died a few years ago in writing a book on Malcolm X. I find we wrote in that book to be unforgivable. Because he went off in some areas here that nobody else has gone off into and even claimed that Malcolm had a girlfriend on the side uh, and that Betty Shabazz had a girl. This is unforgivable. Uh, they, he write this and say, I mean, I thought I was reading the Globe, <laughs> I was reading the Globe magazine, which was, um, which was, <laughs> which was a mag, which, uh, which I was at, <laughs> I was at, uh, I, look, I was at, uh, uh, Kroger checking out at the store. I was talking to this person I was with. I was telling him about 
Look what's on the front cover of Glow Magazine. It was only about Obama and the problems he's having with uh, Michelle. Everybody knows this. And I'm not, there's no news here. And then one more said, do you, you believe what's in the Globe magazine? I said, yeah, uh, because that's better than what you have on MSNBC and what you have in some of these books these scholars are writing, like Manning Marable, for example. And so um, there's no some more sensational than what these scholars are writing. What about one professor a year, several years ago wrote a book about African American African history and claimed the ancient Egyptian actually had wings that used to fly? <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. I mean, who was that? I mean, that was the consider well, how here. that could possibly be considered realistic. I, and they were flying around on rugs too and had airplanes. Yeah. They were able to fly airplanes. Yeah, I mean, this is absurd. There's, it, I mean, you read that for the scholars. That's like Globe magazine to me. And so when that woman was asking me, well, you believe that's on Globe? I said, it's better than what I'm getting from MSNBC. And what I'm getting from some of these uh, writers at these uh, university uh, campuses writing this, this, uh, this nonsense. And you have to go and figure out the truth for yourself. I mean, I don't trust anything. That, I don't trust anybody. I was at a coffee shop. I don't like their coffee, so I'm not advertising for them. But my friend goes there. He likes that stronger brewed coffee. So I was at this coffee shop yesterday, last night they threw us out. And I have this friend, and he comes up with conspiracy, conspiracy. He tells me what's going to happen in 2016, and they've already decided who the candidate's going to be, and all that is because of a group back there in the shadows. And I asked him for the information that backs it up, and he's telling me that um, this other group uh, is doing it, and the ones, and in, in, we don't have no control over it. I asked him, weren't you out there with me in Denver when we went out there in 2008 because we wanted to, to, to believe beyond our wildest dreams that Obama was going to come in there and at least calm down the racial waters and stop pointing fingers and let's get past this conversation to go on and do what we have to do as Americans in this country and Obama was promising to do that change we could believe in weren't you out there with me or did the Illuminati push you into, into the stadium when, when, didn't we go out there together and we were both searching for some tickets to get in there <laughs> we couldn't get in there for three days and wasn't was that you and I who pushed us in there did, we, did, did anybody conspire to get us out there or did we do that on our own and we went to vote in 2008 one of my biggest mistakes. I made the same mistake in 2008 that Du Bois made in, in 1912 when he voted for Woodrow Wilson, uh, basically to flaunt the uh, power of Booker T. Washington, our, one of our greatest sons, in fact, our second greatest son. The, the greatest son was Frederick Douglass. I know y'all going to, I know now I'm going to get you to, <laughs> to, to get on my, on my uh, text. Um, uh, now and you're going to criticize me for that because Booker T. Washington is our second greatest son and we ain't talked about Du Bois yet we ain't talked about Martin Luther King yet so I know I'm going to hear from you now and I'm going to do the same thing I did when you text me on that last thing I did on the article I did on on, uh, <laughs> on uh, Raven uh, Simone and I'm gonna, uh, what I'm going to do is put you in check because I was telling you and I, some of you, put, uh, some of you wrote, <laughs> wrote me and said uh, that's nonsense, because I said Obama's not a black American. He's an African American, but he's not a black American. And some of y'all talk about uh, uh, how uh, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, oh yeah? Yeah, he's an African American by, by imagine conversations with an absentee father and raised in Indonesia by another father. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, he's kind of confused. I mean, I, I'm very confused. Yeah, I mean, he, in another thing, too, though, I told blacks this, and a couple of blacks were agree, groups agree with me. That Obama is not, he has no connection to the to average anything. black person. The man is, a, the man is, you know, we talk about, um, uh, uh, okay, I won't use that word because that's used by, by the Klan in the South, but the man is mixed up in his thinking. Uh, this man is, this man is a, I, you know, most, all the politicians are sociopaths. This man is a psychopath. And if you just simply watch the, things that he does and the things he says I mean you can't believe anything he talks about everything comes out of this man's mouth needs to be put in check you need to go and check oh he said that go and get get, get the documents out and look at it for yourself see I think maybe that's the reason why Bill Clinton might be a good antidote to uh, Obama and I, I mean that's that's taking the devil's advocate because I can't stand either one of them but, <laughs> um, but Bill I mean, at least Bill Clinton recognizes a like-minded individual and can warn you about it I guess he's been warning people 
about Obama, and that's, you know, here's wife word for Obama as, you know, the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, there is a definitely contention about, the, and so uh, you could definitely tell that um, he would definitely would throw in Hillary, you know, Obama would, if something really bad happened, and he basically did let her take the hit. He threw her under the bus. I mean, you could <laughs> yeah. just, I mean, you, these people feed on themselves, man. I mean, they're, they're like sharks in a womb. They are, John, and they are, they are, they are feed on the American people. Uh, we saw that in terms of them trying to act like this person that put a video out that nobody had even seen. They're trying to act like this person is the one that caused the uproar over there in Benghazi. It had nothing to do with their policies. A video, they watched a video, and then the outrage over the video caused them to go in there and kill a UN a UN United States ambassador, along with three other Americans. And they had no responsibility for it whatsoever, and they're going to put this man in jail, having claimed that he's the one that caused a storm that had nothing to do with it. And they threw him under the bus as well. They threw us under the bus the same way, because they're sociopaths, but we're dealing with a different level of sociopathic disorder with this president. This, pre this president is a psychopath. And I know I'm going to hear from all of you out there that's, that's waiting to get in my case because you're not finished with me yet in terms of me telling you that Obama is the opposite of uh, uh, Raven Simone. So Raven Simone is not an African American, and but she's a black, but she is an American. Now she says she's colorless. Well, you know what? Everything that has the material materiality has a color to it. And uh, 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 Chris Wilson, you listen to this right here. You wrote the book called The ISIS Papers. And uh, for you to say that white is not a color, that's not true either. It's, it's saying uh, uh, white, whiteness is the absence of color. White is a color also. And um, if you start out with, uh, with, 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 with darkness or blackness, then everything that's not dark or black is a derivative of that. And so it's, it, there are lighter dimensions of that. But there's no such thing as a materiality that is colorless. Uh, even even um, when you give, okay, well that's that, that's that's an, that's my spin on that. So when you when I said when I said that Raven Simone was um, a black American, to distinguish her from other Americans that are here, um, uh, you don't have to make the distinction about, you know, when you're in Africa, you see nothing but black folks. You just simply say that they are this and they are that. You're not even talking about the color, talking about the ethnic group they belong to. But when you have a, when you have a mixed population and there are different, there's a rainbow coalition, hopefully we get it to the coalition part, we're a rainbow, whether we've got a coalition or not, that's something we can continue to work on if we get shopping out of here and get stop listening to Jesse Jackson and other buffoons. Like this uh, crazy man over there in Chicago. You see, I'm calling them out because uh, you get on my post and <laughs> curse me out. It don't bother me. I, I'm unfazed by it. In fact, did you notice this last week when y'all got on my on my post and you were getting on my case because I did parts one and two on Raven uh, Simone. You couldn't answer it because you can't answer the thing that I write, and you couldn't answer it. So when you got on my case on part um, two, yeah, you probably noticed this. Those of you kept coming back to my post. You probably noticed I went back and revised it and made it more objectionable. <laughs> I revised it and put it back up there again and wrote some more to it and added to it to make you even madder. All you do is, all you, if you provoke me, all you do is make me bring forth more of my scholarship because you may think that you can answer what I, what I write. You may think that. And you're not qualified. I'm here to tell you that. You're not qualified. And every few in the country are qualified. Particularly, all these airheads on the on the college campuses wearing this kente cloth. See, I've been there and done that. And you can wear that kente cloth all you want to, but the kente cloth you're wearing, trying to act like that's comprehensive to the whole continent of Africa, is worn in one place by one group in one country, and nobody else in the country will wear it but this one group that, that created it, and that's the Ashanti. Nobody else in Ghana, which is the origination point of it, will wear that because they will not cancel themselves out culturally. In Africa, go and see if the Mandinka will put it on, or see if they are wearing in Nigeria with the uh, Yoruba, which is the western part of Nigeria, or the Igbo. And I'm an Igbo chief, or the Igbo. Are you a chief out there? I'm an Igbo chief, and they were not wearing in the Igbo, uh, um, uh, anywhere in the Igbo land. In fact, when I asked uh, some of the, uh, the professors uh, in uh, at the university. Uh, to talk to me about some other cultural reference in Africa, they are very much prohibited from that conversation. 
Because you see, in Africa, they live in the continent. Therefore, they can't see the forest for the trees. In other words, the culture is, are the trees inside. But on the outside, the reason I'm more comprehensively involved in African history is because on the outside, you see the whole continent. But they are experts in the place that they have uh, been brought up in, and that's where their the expertise is located. The Igbos, the experts on the Igbo culture, because you don't have any reference to Africa at all. They are over here as experts in that culture. But outside that, there are these limitations. And to that extent, not bragging, but bragging also, is that I'm a little bit more comprehensive in my understanding of the continent of Africa because outside you see it as a continental uh, unit and not specific to a particular group to which you belong. You see, black people can't claim any specific uh, uh, derivation. And that's why R Raven uh, Simone was teaching a clinic and Oprah couldn't understand what it was she was teaching. She said she's black, uh, she's, she didn't say black American, she said she's American, and the American identity is, color, is colorless. She's right about that. The American identity is, is, is the American, to say you're American is, is, is colorless, but to say that the person though, see, you, she got to make a distinction between the designation, uh, the, 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 the nationality would be American, but and when you get into the persons within that nationality, then you have to talk about a more distinguishing characteristic of that nationality. And that's what she missed. But anyway, she was right in saying that she is an American, but not an African-American. All of y'all got mad, stuck your mouth out. And when I was trying to correct you, uh, you, you silly uh, idiots out there, uh, you got mad at me. And I, and I love you getting mad because you can get mad. You're not going to do anything. You're certainly not going to come behind my scholarship and uh, making a correction, that, and, and in case that includes you at, <laughs> at Harvard University, because your piece, I, I give you credit though, I give you more credit, I give Gates more credit than uh, Wallace Yinka gave him, because I think, not not Wallace Yinka, but um, Allen Missouri, I give, I give uh, Gates a lot more credit than Allen Missouri uh, gives him, because Gates was taking a task by Missouri, but I think Missouri was wrong in that one, and Gates did a service in his Wonders of the African World in 2000, but uh, he didn't understand a lot of the things he ran into, and he certainly didn't understand anything about Egypt. <clears throat> uh, that, so you write me about that one too, and, and put that on, put that, <laughs> put that on your list of complaints. And uh, let's see how that comes out uh, when you come when you come out on our text. Uh, your number's on there, but I don't call you back. And then you get uh, you get into that vulgar place. You go there by yourself. I <laughs> I don't have time for you know. Um, uh, X is deleted, and you can use that. But I, I don't, I don't actually get down in the gutter. But I'm willing to, to, to I'm willing to defend, I'm willing to defend what I, what I write, because I don't just throw it out there. I try to make sure that I've done my homework before I get out there and write. And I do a lot of cross referencing before I publish anything. But nevertheless, my, my point is that you know you can go into all these little conversations about your identity and all of that. It doesn't fly when you go to the place that you're claiming as the origination point of your birth, because that's not your origination of your, your birth. That's the origination of your great, 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 great grandfather to the 10th power and great, great, great grandmama to the 10th uh, power birthplace. But you have not been away from that place since uh, 1619. That's when the first blacks got off the boat and got uh, and landed in, in Virginia. And then the last ones have been come here after the slave trade had been cut out officially in 1808. You know, what I'd like to know is like all these like a lot of people at the college used to say 400 years of oppression and slavery. <laughs> well, this country is only 200 some year, 30, 30 some years old as a country. Mm -hmm. So therefore, yeah, slavery did exist as this, this republic was founded. But for 400 years, we have not been around as a country. Mm -hmm. So to make the charge, this country has been in slavery or put slaves in, put people into slavery for 400 years. That's an absurd notion. Well, I, if I, you look at the timeline. Well, I want to make another observation about about that as well. And that is the fact that if you are uh, uh, angry because of the uh, quote-unquote 400 years of oppression, then we ought to see more people in wheelchairs out there throwing rocks. Because the ones I see throwing rocks are, the, are these young people who haven't been around even more than, what, uh, uh, 25, 30 years? You see, nobody, nobody's oppressed 400 years. Because, number one, we don't have Methuselah anymore. We don't have Noah anymore. Can you get to that? That we don't live like they say that they lived during the time of, of the biblical claims. I and mean, some of that is, in fact, you know, astronomical in terms of having to understand how, how that works. And that's something that uh, some of the other scholars need to look at 
But I, I can tell you about those numbers. But anyway, the point is that nobody has been oppressed for 400 years. And most of us uh, uh, can't claim uh, oppression uh, past uh, 70 years. And, and most of that was where we were coming up. We didn't, know anything, we didn't know anything to feel oppressed about. You see, the lifespan is not 400 years. So when they start claiming that they've been oppressed for 400 years, can you give me the time that you start living back there when they were putting people in the, on the boat? in the ark and saving everybody and you were saved and unfortunately there were some politicians on the boat as well <laughs> i don't know how they got on the boat but uh, they, they got on there with the rest of the duckers and, and and elephants and then we got these duckers and elephants out here in these political parties but anyway they got on the boat also and but we haven't had that kind of light lifespan even claimed by anybody uh since the biblical times and they're talking about they had they've been oppressed for 400 years how would that be can you write me about when you write me and, and with the language? Can you write that down too and add that to it and tell me how that, how does that happen that you've been oppressed for four hundred years with your crazy self and how that would be possible? Nobody's been oppressed uh, four hundred years. And you know what? Lighten up on this one as well. Black people are not oppressed in America. You can forget that. Uh, you can just get off that in uh, in in Ferguson. And now you're down there demonstrating because you're crazy because there was a guy shooting at the police officers and he missed. And they did shoot two officers down there and then you start going out there shooting. And the, another person got killed in a shootout and now you're protesting that. And you know what you're protesting now? The, the officer had the nerve to defend himself. And that's typical of the left. Uh, John, let me ask you a question. Have you um, listened to this person by the name of Ivan Say Yet? You know who that is? No, no, no. You got to get in touch with him. He's on YouTube. But he, he has uh, done some Herculean work on liberals. 95% of, of the blacks are liberal. And that explains why their communities are all torn up and, and why uh, they're out there like wired up in their own communities. They don't ever demonstrate about that. But um, anytime you have a situation like you have in Ferguson, then they're out there in the street. All of a sudden, they're outraged over somebody doing one time what they're doing on a daily basis. A, well, the reason why is because the people amongst their own community don't have a big, deep checkbook. That's the reason why. That's exactly what's going on here, that they can't make a claim to guilt in the community. Because what would be the guilt if the people are belong, belong to the same group? that you're complaining about. So there's no protests over there. I have not had an Al Sharpton sighting yet at those events, uh, uh, hollering about no justice, no peace. I just haven't seen it. And I would love to see it in Chicago, which is uh, one of the murder capitals, not the only one, one of the murder capitals of the United States as far as blacks are concerned. They're putting uh, people in, in, in funeral homes uh, on a daily basis over there, and we haven't heard anything about it. And from 1968, let me make sure I get my numbers right, from 1968 to, to, to 2011, 292,000 plus blacks were killed by other blacks. I have not seen 292,000 plus demonstrations in the street protesting that kind of behavior, but every time you get an officer involved in it, all of a sudden they gotta, gotta, gotta go out here and tear their communities up. Because you see what, the, what, what even, uh, Sayat is, is showing in his brilliance is that uh, liberals have a, um, there are several things going on with liberals, one of which is that they have suspended reality and they have a, and they also have, have suspended identifying with um, the person who is not the underdog. So that what Sayat points out, and it's a salient point that he makes, is that in the liberal community, you being objective is and of itself being biased. Because you see, if you are objective, look at your news, for example, where they don't objectively report the news, they side with one of the two sides of the news. And the reason why they do that, according to say yet, and I definitely believe there's a silly point that he made, is that to, to, to report the news as objectively as you can, is not to show sufficient empathy toward those who are supposed to be the powerless and oppressed group. So that when you saw, for example, in Ferguson, when they talked about the shootout that occurred between Michael Brown, not the shootout, but the shooting in which Michael Brown lost his life, 
What occurred was that they only showed you Michael Brown's side. They never talked about what occurred and what injuries were sustained by the police officer. So in the absence of that, you form a conclusion, as they kept telling you that, the, that he was unarmed, well, did he have his hands? Did he have his fists? Did he still have, uh, have his head he could run into you? Did he uh, have, was he still 300 pounds and, and, and therefore pose some danger if he's running toward the police officer? But no, they, what you heard was he was unarmed. As if to say then if he's unarmed, there's no danger to be uh, placed there. Uh, there's no, you can not put into the environment any danger. But what the press was doing was what Ivan Sayat said, and that was uh, sufficiently showing empathy toward those who are looked at as being victims and those that, that claim victim, by the way, as, as an identity, so as to create sympathy for themselves as if they are always the ones that are being victimized and they're not victimizing anybody in return. They're just totally uh, uh, victims of everything that goes on and not in any way taking any responsibility for the victimization they are in fact occur that that's causing both inside their own group and also outside their group as the FBI statistics like indicate. So you didn't you didn't you don't you don't like these kinds of conversations which guarantees that you're gonna get more of it. <laughs> because you see I, I I the drum beat is in my head and I don't dance to the drum beat that somebody else is making as uh, you're finding out, and some people that met me on the, these college campuses that found out that I, I, I dance to a, a different uh, drummer, and I make my, I make my own sounds to dance to. I don't dance to Snoop Dogg and um, uh, this other fool, uh, Jay Z, and that stuff they got on HBO right now, where I, I can't make any sense of it. So I, that, that's not the drama. I, I, my tunes are I make my own tunes. You know, name that tune. Well, wherever the tune is. I'm the one that, you know, made it up or, you know, based, I'm based upon some information that I've, that I've, uh, that I've obtained. So, the, you know, so the question, the question is that Raven did the right thing and, and said the right things, 99% of it, by saying that she was, could, she could trace her roots back to Louisiana. You know something? That's true of 100% of, of blacks in this country. And here's a woman that told, this tells you something about the mindset. Here's a woman that told blacks the truth. Starting with Oprah Winfrey, who was squirming in her seat. You know, Oprah, you know Oprah, the woman went over there and couldn't uh, buy a purse because the woman wouldn't sell her a purse because the woman uh, couldn't get past uh, Oprah Winfrey being black and would not show her a purse that cost $35,000. And if, if any salesperson in that store that's worth their salt, uh, or let's put it the other way. Any person in that store to sell a purse they won't sell a purse, they get fired. And for you to believe that shows how insane you are. But a lot of people jumped on that. So I'm not surprised they jumped on our Raven. But Oprah couldn't stand the idea that she had said that. But Oprah would also have to say the same thing. Oprah can, I don't know what state she's from, but Oprah couldn't go past where state she was born in. And what state can, can, she thought, in fact, Oprah thought she was Zulu. You know, that's what she thought. And she said that in one of her public one of the things, one of her public announcements. She said, I think I'm I'm Zulu. How many black people were taken from South Africa uh during that during that time? I mean, how many does she does she know where West Africa is located? But she's Zulu, Zulu is not even Zulu is in South Africa, Oprah. And I've been there in South Africa too, and I've and I've been in the crowds where the where the, where the Zulus are. And there's open time she's Zulu. And then West Africa, she came, she didn't even know where West Africa is located. And what country, I bet she couldn't name a, a single country in Africa except uh, South Africa. She might know um, uh, uh, Guinea. We know the difference between Guinea, uh, Basau, and Guinea Conakry. Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. She don't know that because of Ebola. Um, and and we'll be able to locate that now because we got the Ebola coming from there. But she thought she was Zulu. That tells you something about. It. So she couldn't go past the state she was born in. Yes, she got mad at Ra Ra at Raven Simone that told the truth, and which all blacks would have said would have to say the same thing if they were honest. But what you had there was a certain amount of disingenuousness and also dishonesty that was being perpetrated by these Negroes out here. They want to claim that they are John McWhorters, they're being authentically black by claiming something that they cannot claim anywhere but over here in this, in this space where they can holler this nonsense 
and would not be allowed to get away with it in Africa. And I've been there in Africa in many places where, where I, I've asked a question. How is that seen over there? And I haven't found uh, two blacks yet that buy into it. I found one this past time, and, and, we, and he was trying to, I think he was trying to accommodate my point of view. I thought He thought that was my point of view. He was trying to accommodate me because I'm over there as a tourist. And I told him, you don't come pulling that with me. I, I ain't buying that, that um, you accept that. Because I go into other parts of Africa. Nobody has said that but you. And it's not accepted uh, throughout the uh, continent of Africa. And I'm not buying it from you. I think you're just telling me what you think I want to hear. Because you don't want to offend me. But you're not offending me. I understand that my limitations, even though I'm an Igbo chief, my limitations are very clear. Because when I was initiated as, a, as an Igbo chief, I didn't explain to me the rituals even of, of that. I understand it now, but it explained it to me because I had no reference to that. My reference was Alabama. I can tell you a lot of things about, about Birmingham, but once you get past that, I'm pretty good in telling you about Flint, where I live now. And then beyond that, I can tell you about some of my experiences uh, there, but I've been over there asking questions. So I know it pretty well by being in the field asking questions, but in terms of that being my own experience, I can't claim that and neither can you. And Raven told you the truth. But Obama, unlike Raven, Raven is a, 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 a black American and not an African American, and Obama is an African American and not a black American. I was just trying to explain to you silly uh, idiots out there and uh, on my Facebook wall uh, cursing me out on my on my on my on my cell phone. <laughs> I mean, it's funny to me uh, because that is you. That doesn't care anyway. But um, all that profanity you put on my on my text uh, on my text. Um, you're the one that's ignorant because Obama is an African American, but Obama is not a black American. And if you say that he is, you tell me how is it that Obama, whose father is Kenyan, never was an American citizen, can be a black American through his African daddy, who never was an American citizen? How could that be? Obama, I'll say this on the air. I know it's going to make you mad, but that's the point. I also heard that he, his mother, surrendered her American citizenship. And that, that's also a problem. So that's also, there's two principles of citizenship, just sanguinis and just soli. Yeah, you go. So he was not born in U.S. soil, in the meaning just soli. And then he was born by American parent, but she surrendered that. She was born, he, he claimed, he admitted in two different places in Europe that he was born in Kenya and was videotaped. He admitted that. Uh, Michelle said that. So we have him dead to rights. Basically, admitting that he wasn't born here. Yeah, I, I tell you what, my how I how I deal with that issue, John. Um, I think there are all these questions that have not been satisfied. At the same time, I know that we're not going to do anything about it because the politics are such that to do something about it is politically prohibitive. I understand that that is not going to happen. We're not going to do anything that's going to interrogate that. So I'm willing to give him Hawaii. I'm willing to give you that. Okay, but here's what I would tell you to do in in and as a, as a precautionary measure um, next. And that is, be sure of what you are doing and who you're voting for in the future elections. In other words, let's learn something so that we're not reinventing the wheel. Is that fair enough to, to my critics? That we don't reinvent the wheel so that whatever mistakes we made in 2008 by having a man come up here telling us that uh, he's going to bring change we could believe in and never did define what change he was talking about and how we didn't know anyway. We got 300 million people in this country, so how we know we believe in it as if we all are, are, are monolithic in our thinking and we all believe the same thing and we don't have any uh, distinction in, the, in, our, uh, in our worldview or our, our national view. I mean, that would be ridiculous right there. So the change we can believe in, I believe in this change, don't believe in that change. So how would he know? But we were willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Next time, let's be more careful. That's all that's about. But you're not going to impeach the, uh, the president, and we're not going to uh, throw him uh, out of office. I mean, I, uh, you know, I wish, but it's not going to happen. So make the best of both worlds here. Let's get through the two years, having learned a formidable lesson, and from that point, go forward and don't make the same mistake over again. And let me say this before we get off the air. We got an election next month on the 4th of November. Folks, I'll be writing about this on Facebook as well, particularly the last week before the election. Let's give Washington something to talk about. It ain't, it ain't about love. It's about getting responsibility and accountability in the nation's capital to let them know that we're here. 
And there are some things we're not going to stand for. Okay, I brought all these books to the studio, to the studio called All Points TV. And did not get to any of them, but I'm going to get to this in two weeks. Because next week, I'm coming with a conversation on the monetary system if it kills me. And we will, in fact, deal with that next week. Until next time, I want you to follow your dream. Because if you don't follow your dream, you will never know what's on the other side of the rainbow.